what I kind of bet on and always bet on is that people actually really resonate with the truth. Even when it's not what they expected, even when it's um, outside of the box, there's something magical about the truth that, that those people kind of stay with. From the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. The holiday season is upon us. And this week, we are revisiting our conversation with author and activist Glennon Doyle. In this conversation, Glennon and I talk about how to bring our loved ones into understanding of equity and justice through the use of storytelling, imagination, and conversation. It's an episode fit for such a time as this, and we hope you enjoy. The holidays can be a challenging time for many. One of the reasons for the extra anxiety we may feel is due to the kinds of conversations and, dare I say, conflict that can come up when we are sharing a meal with loved ones. Our guest today, Glennon Doyle, knows a thing or two about difficult truth-telling, about creating understanding, and about moving people along in their evolution of love and justice for all. On this podcast, we learn a lot about history, about civil rights issues, and about how we can use the law to move the needle. So on this episode, we're going to spend some time talking about how we can best share that knowledge with other people. The folks who may not be as tuned into these conversations or even as impacted by them as we are. Glennon Doyle is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Untamed, Love Warrior, and Carry On Warrior. She's also the founder and president of Together Rising, a nonprofit organization that has raised over $45 million for women, families, and children in crisis. She joins us today to break down how we can better love and lead people to care about the rights and liberties of those most marginalized. Glennon, thank you so much for joining me. Well, as you know, I am so excited to be here. ACLU is my group of heroes. This is a big day for me. Thank you for having me here. It's a big day for us as well. So I want to start by digging a little bit more into your background because there are very clear reasons that you can speak to this challenge that people might be facing around the holiday season. We all have lived an evolution of our ideals of how we understand or communicate about issues of social justice or civil rights. The audience that you built blogging from your closet has followed you through so many different life transitions personally, and then as you become even more vocal on issues of civil rights and civil liberties. And so for those who may not know your story intimately, I was wondering if you could just trace some of that personal history, that evolution for us. Absolutely. Oh, goodness. Okay, so I guess this all starts, and don't worry, I'm going to start when I'm 10 years old, but I'm going to fast forward a lot. Okay, so when I was 10, I I think I was a really deeply sensitive kid, and I didn't know how to deal with any of that. I didn't have the skills or resources that I needed. And so I fell into addiction really early. I became bulimic when I was 10 years old. And as addiction does, when you don't get it sorted out, it just kind of morphed into everything other addiction. And so by the time I was 25, I was really, really sick, a real serious alcoholic and food addict. And one day I found myself on the bathroom floor holding a positive pregnancy test. And although I was the least likely candidate for motherhood on earth, for some reason, I don't know, it just kind of felt like my last chance to show up for my life. So I started going to recovery meetings and got sober. I just remember sitting at my first recovery meeting and thinking, oh, this is where they keep the honest people. These are my people. These are the people who are telling the truth while everybody else is out there saying, it's fine, everything's fine, it's all perfect, marriage is easy, and parenthood is all of that. And so then I started having more babies, and within five years I had three kids, and I was just dripping with children, and I found myself unable to get to recovery meetings. And I felt desperate for a place to really be able to speak that honestly and hear people speaking that honestly about life. So I started writing online because I just was so isolated. Young motherhood can be really just overwhelming and underwhelming at the same time. So I started blogging 
I had this blog community and I started writing books and I had this husband and three kids and our family was just so precious. I mean, we looked like a freaking Christmas card. We just, all the time we did. And I was so proud of myself because I was an addict my whole life. Like, I just never thought I'd even be vertical or an upstanding citizen, much less have this career and husband and chill. I just thought I was nailing it, you know? And then one day, my husband told me that he had been unfaithful to me throughout my entire decade-long marriage. So that was a bad day, Kendall. And we really did everything over the next several years that a couple could do to try to save. We just worked so damn hard. And I just had this, like, feeling, this nagging longing, like, is this it? Wasn't it just all supposed to be more beautiful than this? Is this the love thing songs are written about? Like, this is it? But, you know, women are supposed to be grateful and everything's just good enough. It's supposed to be good enough. So I just buried all of that. And then one day I was launching Love Warrior, which was a story about the infidelity, a story about the kind of trying to scrape it together. It was chosen as an Oprah's Book Club pick very early on. And so it was being released as this big blockbuster. They were calling it an epic marriage redemption story. No pressure, right? And then at the first event to launch Love Warrior, the epic marriage redemption story, I saw this woman standing in a doorway and had that, I mean, it's just so embarrassing to even talk about it because I'm a person who never even believed in romantic love. And now I have this freaking love at first sight story. It's just, it is what it is. It was real. It was this love at first sight moment. And I fell madly in love. And fast forward, I did end up leaving my marriage. I did end up following this love with Abby. I did marry Abby. I did kind of come to life and feel comfortable in my own skin and my own life for the first time in my life. And that community that you were talking about, who started off in this Christian world, who just came with me, just came with me a lot and just embraced me. It's been brutal, as my family would say. It's been beautiful and brutal the whole way through. And here we are. Here we are indeed. Thank you for that. And just for clarification, when you say Abby, the woman you fell in love with, you mean soccer phenom Abby Wambach. I think that's important context. That's who you're married to. I want to talk about how you have navigated those transitions that we just spoke about with your greater community. But first, I want to talk about how you navigated them with your family, the people who are closest to you, because we all know that it's one thing to talk to strangers and another to talk to our own family. How did you approach talking about things like your divorce or coming out to your parents with your new relationship with Abby? I'm so glad you started with that because everybody wants to talk about like the big, like how did you deal with the public? That was nothing compared to dealing with my family. That's like the ultimate. I know people who are the fiercest activists and they're out there on podiums, they're screaming about freedom and then they're at home worrying about what their mom thinks, right? It's like you can feel like you're untamed until you have to call your mom. (laughs) That's how I feel, right? That sounds right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have beautiful, wonderful parents who are my best friends. So it's not like I have parents who have forever embraced me and my decisions and my freedom and my all of it. But none of it mattered when I had to tell my parents that actually I am going to divorce Craig and I am going to follow this love with a woman. I mean, my parents are liberal AF. I didn't expect the fear that came. And it was the kind of fear that shakes you. You know, I've learned that it's not the cruel criticism of those who hate us that shakes us from our knowing. It's the quiet concern of those who love us. I could just hear my mom's fear in every conversation. I just, what are people gonna think? She was so worried about her grandchildren. Are people gonna be cruel? What's the world gonna say? It's this situation where the people who love us are so afraid of what the world is going to do that they are the ones that bring us what they're afraid the world will bring us. So, and I just found myself, I always know I'm losing it. I always know I'm abandoning myself when I find myself 
defending or explaining or justifying myself. So my mom would bring up all this or that or worry or I'm just worried, you know, worry disguised as love. They're not the same thing. But I think a whole generation of mothers were trained to believe that they are the same thing. Like, the What would you I, say is the difference? I think love is braver and bolder. Worry says, I'm going to change you for the world. And love says, I'm going to change the whole world for you. I will spend the rest of my life changing the entire world so that you do not change one hair on your perfect head. Right? Yeah. That's a good distinction. It's different. It's different. Yeah. And it's everything. It's everything to a kid. The difference between those two things, they take all your energy anyway as a parent. Just choose the other one. Change the whole freaking world and tell your kid not to change. So one day, I'll never forget, I was standing beneath a palm tree at this cross-country meet that my son was running in. I lived in Florida. My mom lives in Virginia. She was worrying and worrying and calling that love. And she said, we're going to come. Your dad and I are going to come to visit. And I just had this mama bear reaction that was just a no. Just I just felt a no, a big no inside of me. And I said something like this. I'm sure it was less eloquent than I'm about to say it because I've had, let's see, a couple years to perfect this little speech that I gave my mom. So I'm sure it wasn't this good. But in my head now, it was this good, Kendall. Okay. So I said something like, you cannot come. No, you can't come. Because you are afraid. And my kids are not afraid, right? My kids were not raised in the world that you were raised in. They're in a different reality. They do not know the fear that you carry. But if you bring it here, if you bring it here, they will see it in your eyes and they will help you carry it because they love you, right? So I have to tell you this really hard thing, mom, which is that my job as their mom is to make sure that they don't catch your fear that they don't have to help carry your fear. So you cannot come here, right? Because your fear is your problem. It is not our problem. So you have to go. You have to go figure out your problem. Do all of the things you need to do to figure out your problem because we are an island and we will not lower our drawbridge for you, for anyone who is not prepared to come to our island with nothing but celebration and wild love and respect, right? So go figure out your problem. And when you don't have a problem, we will lower the drawbridge for you, but not one freaking second sooner. And Kendall, that is the moment I became a grown-up. Yeah, I was (laughs) going to say, I think that is just, you know, when I first heard that story, it was such an eye-opener for me because I think we can easily get into these conversations and risk our own humanity in them. And so I just really wanted people to hear that because I think that's such an important piece of having hard conversations is knowing when to pull up the drawbridge. Yeah. A lot of people don't have this experience. Sometimes you draw up your drawbridge and that is it. There's a price to pay for it, right? It's always a risk and sometimes you get the beautiful healing that you wanted and sometimes you don't. And I've had both experiences, but with my mom, she did hear me and she did. And now, Kendall, I mean, she's the fiercest activist in my family. She's exhausting, okay? She switched. She switched from I'm gonna change you to make you different so the world will accept you. And now she has turned to, I'm just gonna spend the rest of my life changing the world for my daughter. I love that. That's great. I love your mom. Yeah, me too. I love her. That's wonderful. All of this is happening in your personal life, and you're writing about it in your books, obviously. You're also writing about it on social media. How did you know when it was time to be vocal about all of these different transitions that you were facing in your life with a wider audience? And why did you choose to do so? Yeah, that was so complicated and hard. And made less complicated by the fact that I am the most important thing in my life. I think it's cool to have like one thing. Like my one thing is my sobriety. Okay. So I make all of my decisions, whether they're work-based, family-based, all of it based around my sobriety. And I know that the only way I stay sober is if I am not ashamed of anything. 
I cannot have shame. It's my kryptonite. It's the one thing that I can't allow. And secrets, secrecy, whenever I I feel like I have to keep a secret, that's my signal that that's something I'm ashamed of. So this was a really tricky time. What I figured out was that there came a point before the publication of Love Warrior, because it was a short time, where I said to my agent, editor, all of the people who were involved in the publication, I have to say that I'm getting separated. This, Kendall, was not (laughs) well-received, okay? (laughs) I can imagine. (laughs) To to say not well-received is like the understatement of the century. This is to a bunch of people who are good people and brave people, but their entire year's success was based on the success of this book. And so over and over, the refrain to me was, no one is going to buy an epic marriage redemption story from a woman who has just announced she's divorced or she's getting divorced. I remember what person I trust very much on my team saying, you can do this, but it will be career suicide. Yeah. So it's so beautiful, O Kendall, to have your one thing because I remember hearing that and saying, okay, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. So I guess I will just have to tank my career because the one thing I can't do is have the sole suicide of of shame. So since that's my one thing, I guess I'm just going to tank my career. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Like, really, this is all very stressful and I really loved being a third grade teacher anyway. So (laughs) awesome. It's just, this is my signal, you know, right? Yeah. I'll go back to the classroom. That's the really most important thing you can do with your life anyway. And so those were complicated conversations. What I'm bet on and always bet on is that people actually really resonate with the truth. Even when it's not what they expected, even when it's outside of the box, if you can stay with the truth, it's scary right now because of social media. It feels like everyone's scared of the immediate backlash and there's always an immediate backlash of anything that's out of the ordinary, but then there's this long tail of the people who are actual people behind the little social media accounts. And there's something magical about the truth that those people kind of stay with. And my people did stay, even the ones who were confused by it, even the ones who were disappointed by it. It was the right thing to do. And I remember saying, you know, I've never promised my community or my people that I was going to be one way or another. I just promised that I'd keep being honest. And then, because there was this time of like, okay, so what's the difference between privacy and secrecy? Because my children, like that's one thing to announce the separation. So great, now I don't have to go out on tour and pretend I'm in this epic marriage redemption story, right? So I could go out with this book and say, so here's the thing though. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the thing about books is they're always published a year after you finish them and life goes on and here <laughs> we are. But then there was this time of, okay, but when do we announce that Abby? When do we reveal Abby? Because right now, this is so new. My children are just getting used to it. My little community is just getting used to it. Like our marriage, or our well, we weren't married back then, but our love and our little family Using the island metaphor, I remember thinking, we're just like this little sapling. We just started to grow and we can't just open it up to the storm of the public, right? So that was, I think we waited maybe like six more months to to really, till we all felt strong enough to share that. And that day was so scary and wonderful. I remember going to bed the night before we put out the announcement and someone on my team saying, okay, well, tomorrow's the bloodbath because we're announcing that I'm marrying a woman to what was then considered a very Christian-based group and it's the internet. And so I remember I posted a picture, I posted a couple paragraphs about our love and then I stepped away from the computer and my sister, because I remember thinking, okay, I'm responsible for telling the truth, but I'm not responsible for anybody's reaction. So I'm gonna tell it and walk away. My sister called me crying like an hour later. She said, Glennon, because she was the one who said, keep your butt off the internet after you do it. She was feeling very protective, of course. She said, I want you to get back on. I want you to read what's happening, what your community is doing to show up for you, what your community is saying, 
who your community is being. And the story was so wonderful because I remember that night reporters calling and the story was not you are coming out, you and Abby. The story was, who is this freaking Christian community? Who, like, who are these unicorns who are embracing this? It was so beautiful. I remember thinking, oh, we thought it was going to be a bloodbath and it's a freaking baptism. It's like the absolute opposite. So you've shared all of these things about your personal life and you start to also talk about social issues right? About things that might be hard truth-telling about your own life, but about other people's lives as well. When did you start deciding that you wanted to talk about things like race or immigrant rights? What was that tipping point for you? So I, from day one, writing on my blog or starting this community, I was always talking about that stuff. And because it's very based in my faith, right? So the idea that love is, you know, the simplest tenet of my faith is love others as yourself. What I will say is that I sure as hell wasn't doing it enough. So I started being much bolder and really understanding that this wasn't an extra part of what I was doing on the earth. This was the thing that I was doing on this earth. So I better be using my platform and my time and my energy and my voice on this almost all the time. When I was sitting with my kids one, I don't know how long ago it was, maybe seven or eight years ago, I was sitting on the couch with my little girls and I was reading to them a book about Martin Luther King Jr. or a march. And one of my little girls pointed to a white woman in the crowd at the march and she, her eyes lit up and she said, oh, mommy, look. She said, would we have been there with them? Would we have been marching with them? And so, Kendall, I just opened my mouth to just say, of course we would have, right? Like that was my, that is exactly what I was about to say. And my older daughter, who's so annoying and is always saying like, <laughs> truthful, honest things, she said, oh no, Emma, we wouldn't have been marching with them. I mean, we're not marching now. And I just was like, that that was a turning point. I still get really emotional about it. I like have the chills right now because it was just like, oh. Like, I'm not the person I think I am in history. Like, I imagine that I would have been marching beside Martin Luther King Jr. What in the hell makes me think that I would have been doing that? You know, that this is understanding that most of us have now, which is like the greatest indicator of to know how we would have shown up in that civil rights era is to look at exactly how we're showing up in this civil rights era, right? It's not rocket science. So that's when I just started really just pouring myself into trying to understand who I was in the world. And I, one night, a couple of weeks later, I came across the letters from the Birmingham jail and I read the part where Martin Luther King Jr. says that the greatest threat to freedom and progress is not the Ku Klux Klansman, but it's the white moderate who is more committed to order than to justice. That's the first time I had language for who I was, which was a white moderate, right? So I would say that that process was kind of the turning point of me, just like I did with every other area in the book, in my life. It's so funny. I think of my life as a book. <laughs> it's just like, oh, I'm not who I've said I am. I'm not who I think I am, for better or for worse. I'm bigger and, and better and wider in some ways, and I'm not as brave. Or So anyway, for the rest of my life, I'll just be undoing that and just understanding that this is not an extra, like fighting yeah. for, showing up, using my voice, fighting for, Loving others as I love myself and my own family is what I'm doing down here. I'm so glad you brought up the quote by Martin Luther King about the white moderate, because I, I want to talk about that. I'm a white woman with a lot of privilege. You're a white woman with a lot of privilege. Entering into these conversations can be tricky sometimes. And I think we risk being too loud co-opting the work of people of color. There's a risk of white saviorism. And when thinking about bringing up these conversations with our loved ones, 
I think this is something also to keep in mind. How do you think about your position as a white person in these conversations? And how have you figured out what is your lane and what isn't your lane? Well, the way that I figured out for the first couple of years is just to constantly screw up. Just to constantly screw up, Kendall. Just to be, sometimes I felt like, okay, maybe my role here is just to keep doing it wrong so other people can watch me do it wrong and not do that. <laughs> That's the first couple years. I think that what I'm starting to understand, every week I just start to understand it more deeply. This week, I've been working alongside and with some a group of ridiculously talented and fierce and relentless, tireless Black women. Lovey Ajay Jones and Maya Peterson and... There's just these women who are working with the -the on-the-ground grassroots Georgia groups who have been just fighting voter suppression for so long and saved us this last election and hopefully will again. And, And I'm just on these meetings and we're just trying to put this stuff together. And it's, you know, all of these brilliant Black women and I'm there just as basically an assistant. And I'm thinking, how funny that I used to think that I was an ally. Like, I used to actually think, like, here I am to help. And now I think, oh, my God, this is hilarious. Like, my job as a white woman right now, it feels, is to quietly understand and listen to what these Black activists and strategists and organizers have been doing for so long and then just show it to my people. It's suddenly, like, the work that they're doing is so unbelievably brilliant, and we're just catching up to it. The idea that we would have to invent anything right now is not how I feel at all anymore. I just feel like my job is to be just so grateful for any time I'm invited into the meetings and minds of these women who have been on the ground for so long and just a little bit at a time, putting it in front of my communities and saying, join this. Humbly and quietly, (laughs) join this, right? Give these people your attention. Give this woman your money. Give this woman your trust. Because these are the people that have been doing the work on the ground for so long. It's like, whatever it is, whatever a group of grassroots, on the ground, Black women tell me is the work, that's the work of that week. So I don't know, I just tell you, it just keeps changing. And what I would say is that my role, I keep working harder and my role keeps getting smaller and smaller. That feels right. I think that sounds right. I wanna talk about the mechanisms that you use and that we can all use to help guide others in their own understanding. You write about the use of imagination and how imagination is the shortest distance between two people. In your book, Untamed, you tell the story that I think is really effective at showing what you mean by conjuring up someone's imagination. And I thought it was both such a brilliant thing to share, but also something that's very approachable for other people, and how we can all use this practice of imagination when having hard conversations. So I was wondering if you wouldn't mind reading a little piece of that story, and then I'd love to talk about it with you. I believe it was the story of Tommy and your daughter. Yes, Tommy was not his real name, but I will. I love that you asked me to read this one because it was so important to me as a mother and as a thinker and as a citizen in the world. And no one has, I haven't read it out loud yet. So I'm just really excited about it. Okay. There is a little boy in my daughter Emma's fifth grade class named Tommy. Tommy never brings in his homework. So the kids never earn the class reward promised to them if they all comply. Tommy falls asleep in class repeatedly, and the teacher has to stop to wake him, which interrupts her lessons and makes her cranky. Anna is baffled by Tommy. Anna walked in the door after school the other day, threw her book bag down on the floor, and said, again, he forgot his homework again. We are never going to earn our pizza party, never. Why can't he just do what he's supposed to do? Thankfully, I remembered the power of imagination me. This is frustrating, Emma. I know. Me. Babe, why do you imagine Tommy might not do his homework? 
Emma. Because he is irresponsible. Me. Okay, do you think that you're responsible? Emma. Yes, I am. I always do my homework and I never fall asleep in class. I would never do that. Me. Okay, how did you learn to always get your homework done? Emma. You taught me to do it right after school and you remind me every day. Me. Okay, do you imagine that Tommy has parents at home who can sit down with him and make sure his homework is done like yours do? Emma. He must not. Me. Also, baby, why do you imagine Tommy is so tired during the day? Emma. Well, he must stay up too late. Me. How late do you imagine you'd stay up at night if you didn't have us at home making you go to bed? Emma. I'd stay up all night. Me. And what do you imagine might happen to you during the day? Emma. I'd probably fall asleep a lot. Me. Yeah. Maybe you and Tommy aren't all that different after all. You're responsible, Emma, but you're also really lucky. Emma still gets annoyed at Tommy, but she has her imagination to keep her soft and open. She knows how to imagine her way into his shoes. I'm not sure it matters if what she imagines is true. I just know that the softening matters. She is learning how to use her imagination to bridge the gap between her experience and the experience of another. And this skill will serve her, her relationships, and the world. I think a kid who practices imagining why a classmate keeps forgetting his homework might become an adult who can imagine why a father might risk everything to cross a desert with nothing but his child on his back. Thank you for that. I think that's so powerful because it does feel like the key to helping people reframe a reality that they're angry about or something that they're judging in someone else, right? Yeah, I started thinking about it when I kept hearing the refrain when we started working together, Rising started working. Our number one passion became the unification of children at the border. And while most people were open and joining in, I kept hearing people say this thing, which was, do you know that some of them knew that their kids would be taken? And they kept saying, I can't imagine doing that. It was this sentence with this certain tone. I can't imagine. And I kept wanting to say, sure you can. Try harder. Try, do it actually. Because when you say, I can't imagine, with that tone, what it means is, I won't imagine. And so what I wanted to say to that was literal. Like, okay, actually, let's just stop and try. Because if you cannot imagine wanting freedom and safety so badly for your child that you would walk a desert for it, then maybe you're not as brave as those people are. Maybe that's why you can't imagine it. Because you're not even close to as brave as those parents are. Yeah. I think also what that story and the I can't imagine, you know, and the the disdain that you hear in people's voices reminds me of truly what we encounter when these conversations don't go as we would hope that they would be going. And I think it's important just as much as it is to talk about the mechanisms to help us have these conversations or what we should be talking about or why we should be talking and having these hard conversations. What is the underpinning of when a conversation doesn't go well? I think that's just a human defense mechanism, right? It's like this thing that you're about to bring into my life is so confusing and so scary. And every ideology is a house of cards, okay? I mean, I know this coming from the Christian world, like this, the idea of, introducing an idea. I mean, I came from a pretty fundamentalist situation in different times of my life. And the idea of imagining something that is different from what I've been indoctrinated to believe, people will do anything to not allow that to happen. And it's not because they don't think that might be true. It's because they do think that might be true. And if I imagine that what you're saying could be true, it's a freaking game of Jenga. What else could be true? Right. 
you pull that one piece out and the whole thing crumbles. And deconstructing, deconstructing our faith, deconstructing our politics, deconstructing who we are in the world is exhausting. It's also the only thing that will ever make us become who we were meant to be, right? It's the single thing that I can look at and say to every single person that I am inspired by is that they were open to deconstruction. But 95% of people are not, okay? This is not a scientific number, by the way. I just totally it. <laughs> it feels to me like, yes. <laughs> like for sure most people are not open to that. I get it. It's like life is hard anyway. People are just trying to get one day to another and you want me to deconstruct my entire life. No. And the way we do that, the way we avoid deconstruction is to just completely separate ourselves from that idea, from that person, from that group. Because we know in our hearts that we cannot stay firm up close, that we cannot hate people up close, that we cannot. So distancing is literally keeping things from getting up close because we know when things get up close, our differences crumble, right? So I get it. I do know that what I can tell you about what has worked, all right, what has allowed me to speak to wide groups of people and keep people that shouldn't be there, okay? Like, like (laughs) algorithmically, people should not still be with me who are, is because arguments and opinions will never sway anyone stories. Well, that story about Emma and Tommy, I didn't add that story because it's a kid's story. It's not about children. It's about people thinking, oh, when I say, well, I'm responsible. Well, I've always paid my taxes. Well, I'm obeying the citizenship laws. Well, I'm, okay, maybe you're responsible, but hey, maybe you're also really lucky. Right? So what I know about the only hope for bridging gaps is story. I can cite facts. I can say my opinion. I can write a think piece about the border. Or I can show a story of a warrior on the ground there. Right? I can show a story of a person who's been in the trenches. I can tell a story like that about our children. And that does seem to just tick. I noticed it with me and Abby. Abby and I can be out there doing 40 pride parades, which we will always do because it's just because it's fun. But we can do this and that. like, act. And then I post a video of me and Abby arguing about me stealing her milkshake. And I swear to you, you can see the wheels turning in the captions of like, oh my God, that's just like me and my husband. Oh my God. What, like your family is blah, blah, blah. It's like this little breaking down of they are different than me. It's a little breaking down of the distancing. Mm -hmm. Is that because you believe story best captures our human emotions that we all very commonly share? I think story doesn't activate tribalism. Were you stories what our parents, if we were lucky, told us in bed? Stories what our teachers read to us? Stories is, is we've been conditioned over time to believe is a safe way to open our hearts and minds to story, right? But most of us have been conditioned to be closed off to the opinions of them, to the ideas of them, whoever them is. Most people's families had a them. And so it's just we're used to putting our armor up for that kind of thing. And stories are where we take off some of our armor and we can just kind of worm our way into each other's hearts. So all of this conversation thus far has been really about talking. And I know you mentioned earlier that talking is just obviously not enough. And it's really talking only serves the purpose if it compels action. So I would be remiss if I didn't allow some time for us to talk about Together Rising. Yeah, I mean, Together Rising started just really organically through the blog community, actually. People just started to want to take care of each other there. And so we just started helping each other financially. And then that kept growing and growing and growing. And then my sister and I really just started becoming, we felt like first responders. It was like people would write to us with their needs, you know, and they were always just things like keeping the lights on or keeping the family fed. And it became, over time, just bigger and bigger and the needs got greater and greater. And 
I remember just going to bed and we would read everybody's stories. I mean, it was all stories, stories, stories. We would read everybody's stories. We would talk to these people. And I just remember my sister and I would spend in the evenings, we'd be like, what is going When we had enough time to stop and think, we'd be like, what is happening? Like, why are all of these people who are working so freaking hard, who are doing all the things we were told to do, who are, why are they suffering so much? One day I remember reading this quote from Desmond Tutu, and it said, you can only pull people out of the river for so long before you look up river and find out who's pushing them in. Okay, and that night was like the letters from Birmingham jail night. I just sat there like, wait, I feel like something really important just happened to my brain. <laughs> it's gonna take me a decade to rearrange everything in my brain after reading that because that's when I figured out, oh, okay. So where there is great suffering, there's always great profit, right? Oh, I see. It changed everything for me because I realized Together Rising is a philanthropy, okay? Together Rising pulls people out of the river. And that is unbelievably important work. I mean, we are first responders to people, women and children who are marginalized and in trouble, just family to family all over the world. We're still doing that. I would say 70% of our days are about those lights, that food, those bills especially during COVID, it's been really intense. But then there's this other part, we became completely involved in the Syrian refugee crisis. We are still spending most of our days working with the warriors on the ground to reunify the families that were separated at the border and are still separated. But that's all together rising, right? And what I realized is if you are a philanthropist, if you are pulling people out of the river, you actually, if you're not careful, become codependent with power. It's like, wait a minute. It felt like every other iteration of being a woman. It felt like, oh, okay, you upriver keep pushing people in, keep raking in the cash. I'll just be down here for the rest of my life, pulling the people out of the river that you pushed in. And isn't that a convenient system? Isn't that convenient, right? So that's when I realized, oh, okay, <clears throat> my whole life has to be, and both. I will always be working with Together Rising to pull people out of the river. But I will also be putting on my other hat, my activist hat, to be giving living hell to the people upstream who are pushing them in. So I really feel like every philanthropist who's paying close attention has to also become an activist. Otherwise, we're creating this like symbiotic relationship with the abuse of power that is just, ooh, it feels off to me. Yeah. We like to think about it as the offense and the defense. You got to play both. The activism versus philanthropy, offense versus defense. Obviously, Oh, Abby will love that. Abby will love that. I'm going to bring in the this offense yeah. and defense. Got to bring yes. the soccer in. <laughs> yeah, so good. <laughs> So good. Yeah, I think it's what it's all about for me. I think every word that I write and read or, or speak is secretly just really about Together Rising. I think that's what, it's like the world universe. You finally, like I'm okay, 40 years old, I finally found this like little talent. Oh, I can write things. And I'm like, I did it, I found my thing. And then I show up and the universe is like, oh, that's cute. We're gonna use that thing and we're gonna get you to the service lane. That's always the big game. Right? Like, for all of us, right? For like, all of us. Whether it's writing or it's soccer or it's business, we can all, I think that's really the point, right? Yeah. That's like the little hook the universe uses to get you. I to agree. Service. I like that. I think that's where we'll end. This was so wonderful. Thank you so oh, much for I joining loved us. Carmen. Every minute of it, Kendall. Oh, thank you so a, much. Such an honor to have you. And, and can uh, you just please tell the ACLU for me and my family that truly you are the heroes of our family and the world. And we're just so grateful for the work that you do. I will pass that note along. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We really appreciate the feedback. Until next week, stay strong. 
At Liberty is a production of the ACLU, produced by me, Kendall Seesmeyer, and Vanessa Handy. This episode was edited by Matt Boynton. Julian Silva-Forbes is our intern. 